Hello and welcome to our virtual lunch and learn today. We'll be talking about Rockwell Automation PowerFlex 525 setup and parameter backup. My name is Rachel Green and I'm the digital communication specialist here at McNaught McKay Electric Company. And presenting for us today will be Bruce Cargilla, Drive's product manager out of our Norcross, Georgia location. We'll have a Q&A portion at the end of Bruce's presentation, but feel free to drop your questions in the comment section as you have them, and we'll address those questions in order during that Q&A. We'll be getting started shortly, but we'd like to allow a few minutes for attendees to join us. As you come in, let us know where you're tuning in from in the comment section. Hi, Gary, thanks for joining us from Greenville. You can view recordings of previous virtual lunch and learns on our YouTube channel under the virtual lunch and learn playlist and we cover a new topic every Wednesday at noon. So be sure to join us on your lunch break. For anyone just coming in, welcome to our virtual lunch and learn today. Rockwell Automation PowerFlex 525 Setup and Parameter Backup. Hi, Chris. Welcome. We'll be looking for your questions as you have them in the comments while our presenter, Bruce Cargilla, discusses the many asset options to program and back up a drive application using the Rockwell Automation PowerFlex 525. Please feel free to enter your questions in the comments as we go along, and we will address those questions in order at the end of Bruce's presentation. Hi, King, thanks for joining. If you'd like to reach out afterward, or if you have further questions for Bruce, you can send us an email at mackinaclive at mc-mc.com. Be sure to let us know which session you attended and we'll direct your questions to Bruce. We will also have that email address on the screen for you at the end as well. It looks like we have a number of attendees with us. Hi, Leanne, thanks for joining. Let's go ahead and get started. Bruce, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Rachel. And uh, hello to everybody. My name is Bruce Cargill. I'm the Drives Product Manager from McNaughton McKay out of the Norcross, Georgia region. And I appreciate everybody on the, uh, on the call today. The uh, presentation today is going to be based around the PowerFlex 520 series of really the 525, highly focused on that, but this would per also pertain to the PowerFlex 523 drive. And with that, we'll move on. So basically, what we're looking at when we do this is we have the drive, which is the power module, and then we have the control module that plugs and inserts into the power module. In that control module, when power is applied, we have a display that's on the front of the, of the drive. And that drive has a different combination of parameter types of settings and displays that you can utilize for your application. So let's just step through those very briefly because it'll set the stage for how we start viewing the PowerFlex 525 drive or for that matter, the PowerFlex 523 drive. And for those of you that don't understand the difference between the two drives, just quickly here, the PowerFlex 525 drive has onboard ethernet on it. So you can see the ethernet link light that's in front of the display that the PowerFlex 523 drive does not have. But they both utilize the same power module, so they are interchangeable. And so it makes it simple if you ever have to replace a power module to reinsert the control module on that power base and get your application up and running for um, minimized uh, downtime and improved mean time to repair. So looking at the parameters, we have a whole parameter group and it starts with the letter B. So when you see B001, which incidentally by default, when you take the drive out of the box, this is what you're gonna see as far as your display goes. And B stands for basic, it's a basic display. And in that basic display, there'll be different parameters called B001 or B002 or B003. For example, B003 is a basic display that would show the output current of the VFD. Going on further down, when you switch out of the B display and go into the P category, it goes into basic program. Basic program is where you would set things like your accelerate, D cell rate, some basic program options, what control mode you'd like to operate in, and also your, uh, your motor parameters that you're putting in for the BFD. The T aspect of the menu 
starts looking at terminal blocks. So there's a terminal block inside the drive. The PowerFlex 523 gives you five inputs. The PowerFlex 525 gives you seven inputs. And you can designate and program each one of those inputs, and for that matter, the outputs as well, to do whatever you want for your application. And we will go through this today. We are gonna pick a sample application and we'll do it together. So just bear with me as we go through the parameters as we continue on down. Next one, which is very important, especially if you have a PowerFlex 525, is communications. So C for communications is where you would set your Ethernet IP address, 192.168.1.10 or whatever it is. Now, additionally, with the PowerFlex 525, um, there is a L set of parameter setting that basically lets step logic. So if you want to do a threading type of application or certain sequencing that you wanted to do, you could do step logic formats that basically go through step by step on your program. The D display is advanced display. So this is where you would view things like your uh, DC bus ripple or your encoder feedback counts if you had an encoder hooked up to the drive. An A for advanced program, leading on down the parameter list, is where you would do advanced program kind of features. For example, if you wanted to implement certain preset values or for speed, or you wanted to select things like skip frequencies or enable flying start, those types of things would be in your advanced program, program settings. Then N for network is if you wanted to add, for example, a device net card into the drive, that, that communication card would go in between the power module and the control base, and the N part of the parameter settings would now be engaged. So you could add, for example, a, a DLR or a dual port ethernet card in a 523 drive and make the PowerFlex 523 drive an ethernet drive. The M parameters are really nice to have as well because any values that you've changed from default, you can go there and it will actually show what has been changed from default settings. The F side of the parameter setting shows your faults and diagnostics. And then G, which we will cover the G ones today as well, are custom views. So you can actually zone out what you don't want and only focus on the parameters that you care about. So. When you're entering parameters into the drive, there are multiple ways that we can do it. This screen shows you the ability to use what's called a 22-HIM-A3, which is a handheld device that you can carry in your pocket, or it could be on a bezel sitting in front of your motor control center or your control panel that has a cable that links onto the DSI port on the front of the drive. When you purchase this 22-HIM-A3, it comes with a three-foot cable with it, but you can actually expand that to go out to nine feet with the 22-HIM-H30. And a lot of customers have asked me, well, what if I want to go out two or 300 feet? You can do that, and there's an interest way, interesting way of doing that by using an Ethernet cable, a straight cat or CAT6 cable, and you could actually plug that into the DSI port of the drive and go out to the HIM and actually use that. So just food for thought for some ideas. But here with the HIM, just to give you an idea, the select key, which is right here, which is this SEL, when you, when you hit that key, it'll toggle between your different menus. The screen that you see right now are the groups. So if I actually entered that and looked at groups, we would look at the groups we were just talking about in your parameter set. Or you can look at your linear list, or you can see parameters that have changed. So it's a very, very nice tool to have if you don't have a laptop that you can go into the drive and actually have descript descriptors on all the parameters and, and so forth. And we'll also show you later on in the presentation how you can use this device to actually back up and store your parameters and your files. The other method is to use Connected Components uh, Workbench, which is a software that you can pull up. You can just uh, Google Connected Components Workbench. You can go into uh, the first item displays there for Rockwell Automation or your Product Compatibility Download Center and actually download that into your computer. 
So once you get that into your computer or your laptop or whatever device you're using, and you have connected components workbench set up on there, which is a no charge download that you can put in. Um, it takes a while, so be patient because it stores all the PowerFlex drives. It does not store any 1336s or 1305s or any of the old drives, but anything that's PowerFlex, whether it's a 4, a 40, a 40P, 40 a 700, a 750 series, whatever, they're all there. Today, all we're doing is focusing on the PowerFlex 525. So with that, in order to get the connection to the drive, we have this cable that's called the 1203-USB. That cable has an anaconda that uses a USB connector that goes into the laptop, and on the other side, you get two cables that come with it. One is a DPI round connector, which is used on the PowerFlex, anything that has a 7 in front of it, like a 700, um, a 70. Uh, 755, that would use that to connect onto the DPI port of the drive. In the case of the 525, there's another cable that comes with it that has almost like the Ethernet RJ485 jack on the end of it. That would plug into the DSI port on the front of the drive, and that's how you communicate to the PowerFlex 525. When you do that, uh, you set up your communication parameters that you want to have. In this case, on the lower right-hand corner of the screen, what you see is I'm configuring an RS-232 device. The COM port that I'm using that I'm plugging in my USB connector to on my computer is COM3. I set it up for the maximum baud rate, and you use the scan port or the old 1770 KF2 device. And that will sync up your device, or you could also do an auto-configure. And that will set up the communications for Connected Components Workbench. And when you pull up the screen, it'll look something like this with your drive on it. So there's another way that we can connect onto the drive. Because the ways that we were doing it before, we had to have 480 volt connected to the drive or 230 volt, whatever our input voltage is, or a 120 volt single phase. Whatever selection of the drive that we elected for the PowerFlex 525, we had power to the drive. In this case, we do not have power to the drive. What you see in the middle here is the actual control module. That control module has a, looking like your printer port, where it has the little port that you stab the connector into, and then the USB connection is on the other side. And this connector is part of the connector set that came in your 1203 USB that we, we looked at in the previous screen. But if we connect this directly to the laptop, in essence, the VFD becomes, the control module becomes a USB stick. And what happens with that is a window pops up as a peripheral device, giving you options like upload, download, or flashing the drive if you wanted to reflash it. Now, one point I would like to illustrate here is that this requires Windows 7. That's the way Rockwell did it. Um, I use it on my Windows 10 box, but it's very, very kludgy. Um, the Windows 7, the pop-up comes right away. With Windows 10, you might have to get this pop-up downloaded separately. Some computers, I see it works with Windows 10, some not, so it's not that elegant. That's why I stress, you want it to work 100% with this pop-up window, you need Windows 7. So from there, for example, I could select down upload, and now I'm on I'm in my office, air conditioned, whatever. I don't have any 480 volt. I am plugged directly like a USB stick, and I can select upload, and I can save that file as a .pf5 file. I can now go into Connected Components Workbench and select import, and I would then import that .pf5 file wherever I stored it on my hard drive. I could change everything in my Connected Components Workbench and then select Export, and you select Export it as a .pf5 file again. And that would actually put it back into the, uh, into the laptop where then I could actually do a download, and that would download it to the control module, and all my parameter changes or wherever I did from it, my application would be encompassed inside the control module. I could then unplug it from my laptop and walk to my power module. Somebody was wiring it up in a panel, stick it on there and it's already programmed. So we've taken a look at 
a couple of things here. We've taken a look at basically the parameter base, the structure of it, how things are defined. We've also taken a look at how we can modify the parameters. We looked at, at the assets of the 22-HIM-A3. We looked at using connected components workbench, whether we had power onto the drive and we could use a 1203-USB to connect onto the DSI port of the 525. We've also looked at configuring the PowerFlex 525 without any power and using the control module as a USB stick. So with all that and all those assets that we understand now, and we have a basic layout of the parameters, let's take a look at an application for our discussion today. I think this is the best way that we can roll up our sleeves here and actually apply a VFD. So let's say our application is a conveyor. A conveyor is a constant torque application versus something like variable torque. Variable torque is where the torque requirements have fluidity to it. For example, whether it be water, whether it be air, for example, you know, pumps and fans. In the case of constant torque, we want to hold better speed regulation, trying to hold our torque the best we can to make sure that our drive doesn't vary too much because we don't want our conveyor bouncing back and forth and varying the load. We, want, we need to hold constant torque. So with that, we're going to use, for example, in our application today, a 230 volt motor, three phase. We're going to use a one horsepower motor that's 1750 RPM, 3.6 uh, full load amps, a little higher because it's 230 volt. Otherwise, it'd be a lower current if it was a 460 volt. And there's a service factor on the motor of 1.15. And service factor basically means, and this is a very important thing to look at on your nameplate that a lot of people miss. Service factor basically means that the motor can run 15% above what the full load amps are rated and still hold specification in terms of all the manufacturability of the motor. So with those motor parameters, we will put those into the VFD. But additionally on the application, we have to look at some other things. For example, the acceleration and deceleration of the motor. In this case, we'll go ahead and set an acceleration rate of three seconds and a decel of 12. And our application also says that it needs to be able to run up to 75 hertz if we require it, even though most of the time we may run between 30 and 60 hertz, let's say, but let's say sometimes we need to run up to 75. And we're gonna use a control mode, a sensorless vector control, because it is a conveyor. This is a better positioning or control mode to look at the current coming back to the drive versus say volts per hertz, which is straight linear math, comparing the volts over the frequency ratios. So with these settings, let's go ahead and we're gonna use connected components workbench. And I'll just have some screen captures for you to look at. So with that, we know that our nameplate volts are 230 volt, and I happen to have a 230 volt three phase drive, so it was the default. So whatever drive you pick, it's gonna have some default values based on the configuration size that you purchased in terms of your drive with that power module. In this case, my standard drive was a 230 volt three phase, so it's, it's not highlighted, it's white. It's the same as a default value. The values that you see in yellow are the ones that I have changed for our application. So the first one is motor overload current, but it's 4.1 amps, why is that? Well, the reason for that is I told you about the service factor with the ability of the motor to still hold spec and go over the full load amps. So you take 1.15 times 3.6 and you get 4.1. And we looked at our, our nameplate data was 3.6 amps. We know it's a 1750 RPM motor, which was our default. It's a four pole motor because 120 times 60 divided by the synchronous speed is four poles. We know that it's a one horsepower or 0.746 times your horsepower is 0.75, that's your kilowatt. It's in sensorless vector control mode. And here we've modified our XL time to three seconds, our D cell time to 12 seconds, and we've modified the maximum frequency to be 75 hertz because we said in our application, we may need to run up to 75 hertz. If I did not change that and left that 60, I wouldn't be able to run the drive up to that frequency. So the other thing we have to consider in our application is how are we going to logically communicate or have the drive change its nature based on our application in terms of inputs and outputs? 
So for our application for this conveyor, we're going to use a selector switch on point number one that has a local or remote operation, and we're going to wire that into digital input number five of the drive. Point number two is how are we going to control the speed of the drive? Well, in local control, we're going to have it operate off of a four to 20 milliamp input. And in terms of starting the drive, we're going to use a three wire control. So we're going to have a push button that'll have a start and a stop. Now, when we go into remote mode, we'll have the drive operate off of Ethernet IP for both control and speed. And the only output we're going to have in our application is a relay output that we'll use to indicate a drive fault. And we'll use R1, which is a normally open contact that we'll use for our application. <clears throat> there are some dip, dip switch settings on the drive when you look at the drive and what you want to set. For example, on the analog output, for the output of the VFD, you could set it up to be 4 to 20 milliamp or 0 to 10. And you could actually modify digital input number 7 to, instead of just being a regular input, you could have it as a pulse input to do some kind of pulse control based on steps. Um, kind of like a, a poor man's encoder, if you would. And then you can set up your input to either be syncing or sourcing. So we've set up our application on what we want to do. So the first thing we're going to do here is on the start source, we're going to have a three wire control. So we're going to have our 24, we're going to use a 24 volts off the internal of the drive, which is terminal 11. And when you get the drive out of the box, it'll have a little red jumper that goes from terminal 11 to terminal 1. And that's because when that's jumpered out or enclosed and you're getting 24 volts to that input number one, you do not have a stop asserted. If you took that jumper out, your drive would have a stop asserted and you wouldn't be able to run until you jumpered that out. So in this case, or the three wire control, we wire up our stop button for that. And our stop start button will be wired up into terminal number two. So when I hit the start, it'll pulse two, it'll start the drive. And because I've got it jumpered out between 11 and 1, it'll keep running until I open that up. That's your three-wire control. For our speed, we said we're going to use a 4 to 20 milliamp input. So those are between terminals 14 and 15, as you see indicated on the screen. And there are parameters we're going to have to adjust because the drives, inputs, and outputs are all programmable. In the case of the three-wire control, we're going to use parameter 46 as a start source and set that up to be a digital input. And we're going to use parameter 47 to set up our speed source to be as desired for 4 to 20 milliamps. So we'll go ahead and set that up now in Connected Components Workbench. Again, you could do this on the front panel of the drive. We could go to the P parameters like we saw on the very first screen for your basic programming, and we could do that on the screen. Or we could do it through the 22-HIM-A3 that I described earlier. Or we could do it through Connected Components Workbench. So here we are going into parameter 46 that we talked about earlier, and we set that up for terminal block input. And our speed reference number one is a 4 to 20 milliamp input. The defaults for the drive are keypad and drive pot. And the reason for that is if you applied power to the drive right away, you could get it running by just hitting the start key and using the pot on the drive to vary your speed. But in this case, we've modified it because we want this local control to be operated off of this, these push buttons. The start source number two and speed source number two, which is our remote for our local remote switch that would be wired in the, in the terminal number five, when I have it on the off position and it's at zero, I basically select one. And when I switch it over and I get my 24 volts now running to my terminal input number five, we switch it to number two. And I'll show you how that's done. Because here on terminal number five, we go ahead and switch it. So when terminal five goes live and it becomes one, in my sourcing input, um, I select speed and start source number two, which we already indicated is Ethernet IP. Otherwise, in my local mode, we, uh, we have terminal block two and terminal block three, which is our three wire control, like we talked about earlier. If you want to look at how these things look, you can actually toggle between 13 and 14. Let me just step out of the screen and go into Connected Components Workbench. If I go to, for example, 13, 
I could look at what, what's going on with terminal block number one input, two, or three. And in the case of 14 here, I can look at, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you can look at terminal block five, six, seven, or eight to see what the live status is of your input, of your, of your IO. So some, some neat things that you can do there um, to go ahead and, and look at what the status is. So you make sure everything's wired up for, uh, properly. And on parameter 76, that'll be set up for my relay output to be a fault indication that a fault is, uh, has gone on with the drive and I'll have a pilot light light up that I have a fault. So that's basically what we've set up. The next area we want to look at because it's going to be difficult to run in our remote mode with Ethernet IP if we do not have an Ethernet IP address in the drive. The Ethernet IP address is very important because out of the box, the settings are 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0, which is not our valid IP address. For our application, for our conveyor, our IP address is 192.168.1.33. So we need to get that into the drive. So in Connected Components Workbench, what I would do is just set it up for my parameters on my uh, address selection, and I would set up 192 on parameter 129, parameter 130 would be 168, parameter 131 would be one, and parameter 132 would be 33. And that would set up my drive where I now have a personality of who I am in terms of this is my social security number, if you would, and my network of my connectivity. So once I get the Ethernet IP address onto that drive, a PLC can see it. Um, I could use my Connected Components Workbench. Now I don't need my 1203-USB. I could just use an Ethernet cable from my laptop into the Ethernet port of the drive, and I could communicate with it this way. Now, I asked, well, why did you change that from, to parameters from Boot P? Boot P is out of the box because you can use Boot P if you don't know um, what your IP address or anything. You can use Boot P to actually identify the MAC address that pulls down on boot P, see what that MAC address is, and then you could just use your boot P software to put that IP address in, and some people like to do that. The other thing is if you had a managed switch and you had DHCP persistence, you could go ahead and use boot P um, for the Ethernet IP address to be downloaded directly to the PowerFlex 525 without you inputting it, but having the managed switch actually dictate for that, what the Ethernet IP address is of the drive so you can leave it in boot P in that, in that situation. So the other way we can enter, enter the Ethernet IP address, again, is using the 22-M-A3. Here you can see the example screenshot of parameter 129, which is 192, that I could enter it onto the, uh, the HIM and it would load into the drive. Obviously, I could go into parameter C129 on the faceplate of the drive and enter it that way as well. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to indicate here is if you're using control logics or compact, compact logics, the Studio 5000 add-on profile does require, if the drive is to be seen in your Ethernet tree, that you have an Ethernet IP in the drive. So this is very important to have an Ethernet IP address input into the drive if you want to have any communication. So we've gone through quite a bit here, looking at how we can look at the different parameters, how we can modify and massage the different parameters, what our application looks like, and we have basically defined the application to run now. We could do everything we've done on these parameters now, connect the drive, and we would run. And uh, there are a couple of other minor steps that we'd like to do. Uh, when we're doing this is that we would like to tune the drive. If you operate a drive in sensorless vector control mode or vector control mode, you definitely want to tune the drive. And the reason you want to tune the drive is we want to match the motor best way possible to the VFD. And what we have to match on the motor is the resistance. So the motor is going to have a certain resistance value to it. It'll be estimated with 
Rockwell thinks it is based on your selection of this 230 volt one horsepower motor. There's no better way to get that resistance value into the drive for better operation than to do an auto tune. So if you do a static tune in sensorless vector, we will get the resistance value of the motor. But better yet is if we could do a rotate tune. And the only reason you do a rotate tune is to actually get the exact flux current that you want inside the motor. So rotate tune can only be done is if you disconnect the motor from the load and you have a free wheeling motor. So as long as you can do that, you could do a rotate tune, which inherently would do a static tune first. And that way we'd get the actual flux current of the motor. And the reason flux current is so important is because the current that's going to do the work from the drive is going to be basically looking at the flux current plus the square root of the flux current squared plus the actual torque producing current squared. So if we get the flux current wrong, you got too much flux, you don't have enough of the working current that you desire to have. So this is why rotate tune is more optimal, but at a minimum, static current would be uh, desired at a minimum for sensorless vector control. If you're running volts per Hertz, it doesn't matter. It's linear math, so it really doesn't matter. So that's the differences, just so you understand. So that's, that is one step we'd like to do in our application. So once we have all the parameters set up and done, what we want to do now in our world is we only care about a few parameters, let's say. So we can now go to this custom group and we can actually go down here and see all our parameters and add the ones we care about. And these are the ones highlighted in yellow, motor overload, overload current, main plate value of the full load amps, XL one time, two, and so forth. So with that, we have this custom group application that I don't, you know, you only filter out out of these 850 plus parameters in the drive. We only care about the five or six that we want to look at or for your operators to look at. So it's kind of neat you can do that. And here it is. I now have my custom group. This is all I see. And this is where this GC setting, and this is one of the most confusing things that people have is why, do, what is GC? What do I need that for on the front display? So let's say that you don't have connected components workbench and you don't have a 22-M-A3, that the operators can go to the GC portion of the parameters and they will only see the parameters that they care about or that's important to that process. So it's just food for thought on one of the hidden secrets, I think, or the gems inside the PowerFlex 523 or 525 drive. So we've talked about configuring the drive. We've got everything set up in the drive. We've gone through a whole application. Now let's talk about backing it up and saving it. So what tools or assets do you have? Well, we've looked at, we can connect to the drive through ethernet or we can connect to the drive through the 1203-USB. Um, now keep in mind, these are ways of doing it if you don't have a programmable logic controller hooked up to the drive with Ethernet IP. In this case, we, there is no PLC, we just have a standalone drive and we're using CCW. So we could connect CCW and when I go up to my file, I could do backup project, it's a pull down, I'd get this display. I could change it to my conveyor um, store it in my location that I have, hit OK, and it would store the project, and I would have it available in the future for me to pull up. Now, if I had a PLC connected, the ACD file, when you actually back up or upload the, the PLC to your Studio 5000, it extracts everything, your ladder logic, it extracts everything, including all your add-on profiles, which my our 525 drive in that case would be one of the examples, and all these parameters would inherently pull up in your ACD file and your PLC logic. But in this case, as I said, we're standalone with no PLC connected. We're connected just on the power device itself. So this is a nice tool to have that you can actually organize your own library of things in your hard drive for your applications. So what is the other way that we could do it? Well, we could utilize the 22-M-A3 that we talked about before. Not only could we look at diagnostics on this device, not only could we set up the parameters or modify things as we were looking at earlier, but we can actually do what's called a HIM copycat. And using our selection key with the bars on the bottom that we saw before, or the tabs, we could select over to MEM for memory, 
And when you entered that, it would pull you into the HIM copycat menu, which is the screen that you see on the left here. And the HIM copycat menu gives you the options to do device to HIM with the right arrow or device pointing towards the device with the arrow from the HIM. So device to HIM basically says the device, which is a PowerFlex 525 in this case, would upload to the human interface module. And this lower selection here would be the human interface module would download to the device. So those are the options that we have available and we can actually change the file name. And then in this case, we're doing a device to him on the lower right corner. So we're actually uploading everything from the drive into the human interface module. You can do this while you're running with the VFD. You don't have to do anything to time out how much time you have to disconnect the him like you do on a 755 drive with the Far parflex 525 drive you can actually connect and reconnect the him as you want and you could actually back this up or as you want it obviously you don't want to download a file while you're running but you could upload while you're running and then you could disconnect the him go on to the next one you put it in your pocket or your toolbox or wherever you hold it and you have it available for you and so it's a very nice tool for somebody that does not have a laptop so with that, we've completed our application. We've gone through all the parameters for our application. We've looked at the different means that we have for uploading and downloading and how we can store things. And um, at that point, Rachel, I think we're good to uh, answer any questions that anybody may have. Okay, great. We do have a couple questions. Um, I will read them out. They okay. begin with a question from Mark Huffman. And one of our systems engineers from Greenville, Gary Smith, actually did step in and answer these questions. But I'll go ahead and read them out for you, Bruce, in case you want to add anything additional to those responses. Okay. Okay, so Mark asks, um, on the AMP setting, we have to add the number to the software. And I think he's asking, will it not automatically do the math? And to that question, Gary responded, um, there is no program setting for service factor. The FLA and OL settings allow you to enter both settings independently, FLA for motor control and OL for overload detection. Correct. That is correct. Okay. And Mark did have a follow-up question to that. Um, just to clarify, he was asking, when I change out a 160 drive to a 525 drive, with the serve factor setting on the 160 to 150%, I would multiply the FLA by 1.5, correct? And Gary responded to that and said, it appears the um, BUL 160 used a similar parameter setting, number 42, also called motor OL current. And um, I don't know if you wanna add anything at this point or have follow-up questions here. Yeah, there's just, there's a, a, a clarification I'd like to make because the overload setting is basically that's the nameplate data. You're looking at the nameplate information of the drive or the motor, excuse me. And a lot of people confuse that with, well, I thought you could do 150%. Well, the 150% is basically what the drive has available to it to produce. Should there be a load requirement that you need 150% whether it's normal duty or heavy duty, right? So for a normal duty application, um, you can do 150% for three seconds or 110% for 60 seconds or heavy duty 180% for three seconds or 150% for 60 seconds. So this is where how much demand, for example, if you had a, you know something crushing rocks or whatever the high demand would be, this is the drive innately being able to do these things. but service factor is a different thing that a lot of people get confused service factor is the nameplate of the data of, of of the motor got it okay he did have an, one more question the drive on the him has to be the same version or it won't load that's a that's a really good question because the the him device um will connect with the drive and upload and download your parameters the HIM device, it gets a little more complicated when you get into the 700s and the 750 series drives and so forth, because if you have parameters that you're trying to change and you have compatibility mismatch with firmware and so forth, you could have issues. But it, with the 22-HIM-A3, you can plug that into the, um, the PowerFlex 525 
And you always want to have the most updated uh, firmware levels um, on your devices, which you can go to the product compatibility download center if you had a really, really old HIM or whatever. Um, but you always, the HIM will connect. When you connect that, that HIM onto the, uh, the VSI port, it'll pull up and, and show you the, uh, you know, a welcome screen with Alan Bradley Lowe on it and step into everything with you. Okay, great. Mark, um, I hope that answers your questions. If you have follow-up questions after this, though, please do feel free to reach out to us at that email address on the screen, macamaclive at mc-nc.com. We have one more question from Utsav. He asks, can you tell me about data links for the PowerFlex 525? Yeah, data links are actually stored inside the C parameters of the drive. So the C parameters, we were talking about 128, 129, the IP addresses and so forth. But as you dig down deeper in there, you'll have C parameters that will have different locations, meaning what they are. So data links is basically the ability for the drive on Ethernet IP with Ethernet connectivity, with Ethernet IP to the PLC, is that you'll get um, eight in, eight out. And you'll have the ability to set up what you want to look at. For example, you can set up the first data link to be DC bus voltage. You could set up the second data link to be DC bus ripple, whatever you want. And it stores those parameters that you select in your add-on profile for your PLC to be data link one, data link two. And so you can then pull down in your Studio 5000 when you're looking at your bit mapping, if you would, of your drive, when you pull up into the drive, it'll actually come up and you'll see the descriptors of if you select the DC bus voltage, it'll come up as DC bus voltage in your controller tags. And you can actually use that in your program wherever you'd like. And that's where it's defined. But it's also stored inside the C parameters of the drive itself. So I could literally go in and, and go into C parameter 142 or whatever and change that data link there and it'll show up inside the add-on profile but the easiest way because it's easier to see what you're looking at when you have a full screen to set it up in the plc that way and then uh, that's all set up in your controller tags and coordinated got it um we have a comment here from uh, Mark H, uh, who says, I am uneasy about starting and stopping over the net and don't want to give up the hardwired digital inputs. Am I being too cautious, he asks. Well, let me tell you, Ethernet IP is a very robust and very fast and reliable network. And a lot of people do starting and stopping over Ethernet IP every day. It is um, very deterministic. Um, it is a very... Um, robust and, uh, and, and uh, honestly, one of the best networks. Um, and so a lot of people do it over Ethernet. I don't think you have an issue to do it over Ethernet. Um, if you want to have the ability to stop and have that hardwire, it's completely your choice. But I, I, I don't see an issue with it. And incidentally, uh, just so everybody knows, the red button on the drive, when you hit stop, it stops. Okay. Um, so you always have that red button always available to you. Okay. Um, so now the start source, you know, we set up the, the start source to whatever, whatever it is. We can do it from Ethernet like we did with our example, right? Um, so you do define that. Um, but the stop is always available with that, that red button. So it's really a matter of your choice. Um, are you being overly cautious about it? It's really your personal comfort level with it for your application and how you want to do it. The drive gives you that flexibility. Great. That's great information. Um, we'll give just a, a few seconds here to see if anyone has any follow-up questions for you um, after those great responses, Bruce. And while we wait, I'd like to reiterate that you can always reach out to us even after this presentation has ended or if you're watching this as a recording at the email address there on the screen, mathematiclive at mc-mc.com. And if you just mentioned the title of this session, we'll be sure to get your question over to Bruce and he can answer you directly uh, via email. And it doesn't look like we have any follow-up questions at this point, so we'll go ahead and sign off from here. I wanna thank you, Bruce, for a really wonderful presentation today. 
Thank you to everyone who joined us um, out in the audience and for these uh, incredible questions. Thank you so much for giving us your time and attention today. We hope this session was informative and engaging for you. Remember to subscribe to the McNaught McKay YouTube channel for more industry content, and we look forward to seeing you live again soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great. Thank you.